the, the equations in this expansion or uh, is uh, because it's this like uh, order one plus one or order ah, sorry yes okay so okay um right yeah the, the one over r term shouldn't be there i mean you can just have it okay uh, you can, i mean you can just put it and see plug it into the equations of motion and see that it has to be zero okay, okay. um this is in the Pfefferman graham expansion okay right? otherwise i can if you look at it you can shift r by a function and that will give you an one over r term in this expansion so you can see that it really depends on the kind of expansion you are doing. Okay. You can do a coordinate transformation and have a one over R term, but you would no longer be in the Pfefferman Graham uh, coordinate system. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I am asking because I remember that in the in pure gravity in at least I don't remember four dimensions, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. the Pfefferman Graham expansion, the equations say said that the the odd or the even term are not present. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm uh, right. asking here but if it is uh, take place this as well, even though there are matter fields. Uh, even even if the if even because if here we matter have matter field and the equations are well not the pure gravity. Fields, um, they are going to give you what? They are going to give you quad one term, for example. Quadratic terms in phi, right? Quadratic terms in phi. Uh, I mean, the back reaction uh -huh. is going to give you something proportional to phi squared. Uh -huh. So that can give you, an, I don't know, if, you, if phi s multiplies phi v, that can give you a 1 over r to the power d. OK. I see. OK, well, thank you. No problem. That would still be a function. That would not be a constant of integration. It would still be a function of whatever sources you have in your system. So yeah, I wanted to mostly stress where the constants of integration appear in this expansion. Right, this is where the constants of integration are. More questions, general questions. Uh, hi. And so I had this question. So, um, so when you wrote down the entropy of, uh, you know, the entropy of, of a black hole in ADS, you were referring to uh, basically the global ADS so that the black hole is indeed has a finite area, and you can calculate a, um, an entropy successfully. Uh, but I know that there are also some statements that are done in the Poincare patch about entropy densities. I do not know. Uh, the first thing I think is uh, the viscosity to entropy bound, which is this very famous result. So what, uh, my question would be, uh, what of what you said uh, today can be you know, transferred to holography made on uh, the Poincare patch instead of the global uh, ADS? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So many things go through. Uh, as you say, since the Poincare, in the Poincare case, the theory lives on a non-compact uh, space. So there's no finite entropy. There's at best a finite entropy density. And, and a simple way to uh, get those equations is, for example, if, this, if the boundary looks like this, is to just temporarily assume that all the spatial coordinates uh, are finite and periodic. So you just imagine that they're all living on some torus. This is the usual trick when you want to compute the density of a gas. You put it in a large box, and at the end you synthesize the box to infinity. So you put in such an infrared regulator, then you just use the same finite volume uh, expressions, like S is A over 4G and so on. 
Um, but then, and then you can take the limit where this goes to infinity, and then you see that you get uh, something that's proportional to the volume, and you can read off the density. So it is pretty much like in StatMac, you put in a finite volume, you do the computations, and then you send the volume to infinity. So uh, one thing that happened today was that uh, at a certain point we were discussing this uh, low temperature phase of, you know, at low temperatures you can show that in the global case you do have a phase of which is different from the ADS black hole and you mentioned the fact that uh, in the Poincaré patch you always have a black hole. Uh, can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, that's... that's um, um, in some sense, you can see that if you do the system in finite volume, you have this transition between a thermal gas and a black hole. But you can also see that as you increase the volume, the temperature where the transition happens goes down. And therefore, in the infinite volume limit, uh, basically the temperature goes to zero. So uh, that's precisely what happens. That, that's a simple way to think about it. So, but uh, a temperature is equal to zero, do you have a black hole phase or not? Because you know, one can have a no, an extreme uh, that's black hole. At, right. at t equals zero, you just have a uh, the usual. Uh, let me say it differently. Um, so if you have a system with a finite volume and some temperature, and this is a finite volume, uh, by scale invariance, it's the same as sort of rescaling everything here by lambda and everything here by lambda minus one. That's your scale invariance of the theory. So as you scale up this volume, this temperature where the transition happens simply goes down. It follows some scale invariance. And also by scale invariance, the other way to think about it is that if you're um, on the plane, there's no scale in the theory. If you're in finite volume, that sets a scale. And that allows you to even have uh, a non-trivial temperature to begin with. But if you have any conformally invariant theory on a plane, there is no scale in the problem. So how could any dimensionful parameter have a preferred value? Because by scale invariance, it's equivalent to any other value of that same dimensionful parameter. There simply is no scale in the problem. So because in uh, a way, this is kind of a stupid argument, but uh, yeah, no, no, it, it's I, true. I, I actually, <laughs> it does work. But on the other hand, what I would think is that maybe I'm completely wrong. But uh, can you still have in a, in a conformal invariant theory? So all finite temperature states would be basically the same because you, you can rescale the temperature to whatever you like, but that lambda cannot be zero, I guess. In a, so in a way, the zero temperature state is a different thing. Isn't that the case? Well, you could ask whether there's like some weird scaling limit where you keep some non-trivial stuff even as you decompactify. Um, I, I don't think there's any reasonable limit of that type that you can take. Yeah. No, no. Thank you. So you can always ask more questions as you, I mean, about the exercise or general as you work, so. Um, I, 
have a question to Jan. Uh, in some moments of yesterday's lecture, you mentioned that the ADS2 is non dynamical. And I want to know if this has something to do with the fact that the Euler characteristics of two dimensional surfaces are topological invariants, or is other things, some other thing? Um. Not in any obvious way. Um, the actual computation to see that ADS2 is unstable uh, is in a paper by Maldacena and Strominger called anti Sitter Fragmentation, where they explicitly show that if you add a small energy perturbation to ADS2, that you generate a stress tensor which has a violent effect on ADS2. Uh, so it's unstable. There's a different way to do it, uh, to think about the instability and why it's very unstable. If you do exercise one and you do the bottom part, uh, so this is the statement that if you have a, a sort of a black hole-like solution and f and g have a double zero, then we have a so-called extremal black hole. And in this case, in the extremal black hole case, if you go close to the horizon, space-time looks like ADS2 times something. If you have a regular black hole, so that's the point of this exercise, if you have a regular black hole and you go close to the horizon, things look like Rindler. But if you have an extremal black hole, things look like ADS2. These are zero temperature black holes, they're extremal. Now, as you see, there is an incredible difference between this near horizon behavior and this near horizon behavior, because this is ADS2 and this is Rindler. For all non-zero temperatures, this is what it looks like, but only for exact zero temperature is this what it looks like. Now take an extremal black hole with this metric in the, in, close to the horizon and throw a peanut into this extremal black hole or some other light object. Then this has the effect of making the black hole slightly non-extremal because your extremal black holes, they always saturate some bound, like mass is equal to charge, or mass is equal to angular momentum. If you throw something in, then you typically increase the mass, but not the charge. So if you have a charged black hole, and you throw in a neutral peanut, you increase the mass a little bit, and the charge does not change. That means that th this near horizon uh, geometry, even if it's only a peanut, must change from this to that. That's a very dramatic change. It's not a small change for ADS. It's not like you have a little wiggle on ADS. No, uh, this ADS2 really gets changed into this. Uh, and that's a very large back reaction. So that's in some sense a black hole version of this fragmentation phenomenon. Uh, yet another way to say it is that if you have an extremal black hole, the horizon is infinite proper distance away from an observer. But in an ordinary black hole, the horizon is a finite proper distance away from the horizon. There's a large difference between something that's infinitely far away and something that's finitely far away. So what must happen is if you throw the peanut into this infinite throat that, that approaches the extremal black hole, at some point this horizon must starts to come toward you, and it has to come from infinite distance to finite distance. It's again a very violent process. So these are all reasons why ADS2 is unstable against small perturbations. There are some solutions by Josef Bena, uh, the, the, the gang of the fastballs, etc., where they have some asymptotic ADS2 that then is deformed into some smooth, smooth space. Uh, what, what's the, so what I remember in the paper of Maldacena, Strominger, Michelson is that it's just vacuum ADS2, right? There is nothing else. So why these extra fields allow dynamics in ADS2 that without them it happens what you explain? Well, I don't know if the full answer because I'm not sure I fully understand what the implications of those solutions are. Uh, it's true that this fragmentation argument applies to empty ADS, so just standard ADS. Um, I don't think it is meant to imply that you cannot have other solutions that are asymptotically ADS, 
but they should not be continuously obtainable by starting with a small deformation from the vacuum and gradually going there. So they should not be continuously connected. You could imagine having different solutions that are asymptotically ADS2 that are simply disconnected um, from the vacuum ADS2, and they might suffer the same instability. They, they might be representing a different state in the theory. Um, but it would seem to me um, that it's unlikely that there is a simple path from empty ADS2 to these excited ADS2s where you have solutions that remain asymptotically ADS2 all the way. So I imagine they have some other charges or some other feature, uh, which makes it just different states in the theory that presumably also have instabilities as you perturb them. I imagine these are all BPS, as most of these things tend to be. And um, yeah, But yeah, it's interesting to see how they uh, uh, precisely fit into this discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we were talking later on in the lecture about decomposing Hilbert spaces and reduced density matrices and that sort of thing. Is it clear that there will be a structure such that von Neumann algebras are of the right type to even emit a trace? I, I remember a result of Witten about 1 over n corrections having an impact and making sure you always get type 2 and that sort of thing, but it, it's never been clear to me when you know that you'll even be able to define these things. An index? Sorry? You said an, when you're defining an index? No, the, 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 the traces that you need to Yeah, yeah, to well, um, in quantum field theory, just in quantum field theory, and uh, the algebras associated to finite regions are always type 3. Yeah. There's no trace, end of story. Yeah. Uh, now, in some cases, you can cook up situations where you can change the type 3 into a type 2 then you can uh, define traces, but they're not normalized. Right. But if you fix normalization, you can sort of look, ch look at the change in entropy between different states. Right. So that is something that can be done. Uh, and in type one cases, you have just a plain vanilla trace. That's roughly the story. Um, now, in the boundary theory in ADS-CFT, there's a difference, but if you're on a cylinder, uh, that, so that, that has a discrete Hilbert space, that's, the, that's a type 1 system, okay. because it's on a cylinder. That's, a, that's an honest type 1 system. You can find a trace, a partition function, anything. Uh, however, if you look at perturbative quantum field theory in ADS, you don't get a type 1, you get a type 3 algebra. Mm -hmm. And then you can try to augment it slightly in a type 2. But that's still kind of a perturbative setting where you take a little bit of back reaction into account, but not the full thing. Uh, I don't think anyone has any good idea how the type 2 gets converted into type 1. That's really, that's the mystery of quantum gravity, if you want. Mm -hmm. And all the, all the deep puzzles about quantum gravity, uh, the information laws and, and, and so on, they all have to do with the fact that the actual theory is type 1, but any random semi-classical perturbation, including perturbative corrections, never gets you in this type 1 regime, and therefore you never see the actual quantum gravitational structure. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's answered the question, but um, yeah. No, 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 that's good. Thank you.
Um, the second thing um, is to show that for a non-extremal black hole, the near horizon region has a, a Rindler piece. And the third one is to show that extremal black holes have a near horizon alias too. This is just uh, you know, to do this computation for yourself to show that uh, this is a black hole in ADS. To compute the Hawking temperature, the entropy, using that result for the Hawking temperature and to use the ESTDS to show that the energy is related to alpha by this equation. And the last one is to show that we're in finite volume here, to show that as you go to higher and higher temperatures, that the system becomes extensive. You expect in any theory that at sufficiently high temperature, the theory becomes extensive. Uh, but at finite temperature, this is not an extensive system, so you don't get an entropy density. But in this limit, uh, you get something extensive, and in particular in this limit, uh, the entropy density and so on should reduce to that in, uh, in flat space, in the Poincaré case, but only in the high temperature limit. Because by this argument, uh, if you want this to be, uh, you can see that increasing the temperature is kind of the same as increasing R. So if you want to go to the Poincaré case, you just have to crank it up to very high temperature. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, in case of near extremal black holes, the near extremal black holes, the ADS2 phase comes in between the two horizons, right? Uh, yes. So, yeah, when two. Oh, sorry, for an extremal black hole, the ADS2 yes. is just on the outside of the horizon. Outside of the outer horizon. I the mean, outside of the outer horizon. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, not in between on the outside. This is basically the case where if you have an inner and an outer. Suppose you have okay. that this thing has two zeros. This is the situation where the two zeros coincide and collapse. So in right. some sense, the region between the inner and the outer horizon is gone. Um, right. And and but the ADS2 just is on the outside. No. Uh, I mean, uh, as I've calculated uh, that uh, these two horizons. When comes nearby, okay, there is some epsilon distance between these two horizons. The space can the space will be like ADS two cross S two something like that, right? The region in between. In between, yes. Or maybe there is a scaling limit in between as well, but uh, yeah. in some limit. Yes. Uh, right. Maybe there's some funny limit you can take. I've never thought about that limit, and I'm not sure right. what it would mean. So I, I don't okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, so this follows one more question. So basically, uh, we see that like uh, some uh, unreal effect near the horizon, let's say some Hawking radiation, like the unreal effect when uh, it becomes a Rindler space, right? When this is non non extremal black hole, okay, mm, we see something similar to unreal effect when we are close to the horizons. Yeah, when you're close to the horizon, uh, you see some something radiation. similar to the underworld, but only in this case, yes. not in the extremal case, because then you're at zero temperature. Exactly. And also, uh, the reason you see this, uh, yeah, underworld radiation is basically because right. close. To, it's precisely because close to the horizon, you're in this right. rental situation, so you're locally. It's kind right. of indistinguishable from the uh, computation that I did for the ground state in Minkowski space, right. being some entangled rental guy. So that's right. that's basically that setting. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So here you see Unruh radiation, but here you, you know, this is a zero temperature black hole. It doesn't really Hawking radiate. There's nothing to radiate because it's extremal. Right. So black hole is a, a black like a black body is quite consistent with these things. Like t equals to zero, there is no radiation. That's right. Yes. Yeah. It's just sitting there. 
right so at t goes to let's say okay let t goes to infinity then the uh, t horizon goes to infinity yes yeah, okay. then the horizon will yeah then go the horizon goes uh, goes like if it's in ads yes. then the horizon yeah. goes towards the boundary of ads uh, because the right. higher the temperature the larger the black hole in ads uh, right so basically then uh, then is there is no question of radiation i mean well then yeah. no no then yeah so mm -hmm. uh, what i didn't really say yet is that mm -hmm. if you have a black hole in uh, in ads right. it's different from a black hole in flat space mm -hmm. because in flat space a black hole radiates and it will evaporate mm. but ads is a box right. so what will happen is that you radiate yeah. but then the radiation gets gets bounced off the wall of the box and goes back in right. and so a black hole actually reaches some equilibrium situation okay but almost all the entropy is in the black hole there's only a tiny mm -hmm. fraction is in so there's a black hole that has some radiation cloud around it Right. Um, so there is, besides the entropy in the black hole itself, there's also a tiny bit of entropy in this cloud around it. Okay. Uh, mm. But that's that's down by one over n squared uh, compared to the uh, entropy of the black hole. So it's a tiny fraction of the total entropy. I but see. if you wanted to do an actual computation of the entropy of the black hole, yeah. you sort of have to remove the cloud first. Right. Mm. Ashok Sen once called that a hair removal from a black hole. You need you, you want to get okay. rid of the hair, of yeah. this cloud of radiation, if you want, uh, because that's also a bit of entropy. Yeah. Uh, so the CFT answer is not exactly the same as the black hole entropy. The CFT answer hmm. is the black hole entropy plus the cloud entropy. Plus the cloud entropy, right. Okay, thank you. This is, I think, a general question, and more, I think, is basic. Um, this is uh, about the, the relation between the, this uh, Hawking temperature and the local temperature. Uh, they are related, like, like a red, uh, redshift factor. Uh, this this uh, local temperature in the infinity in the boundary is not, uh, is not corresponding to this uh, uh, Hawking temperature. Uh, in ADS, right? Uh, but uh, I have read that this temperature uh, in the holography in the, in the dual in, the, in systems in finite, finite temperature, they use this Hawking temperature. But one, well, no, I think that if you use that temperature, it's because it is in the it's the local temperature in the boundary. But uh, I think uh, I'm confused in that in that theme. Why they use this Hawking temperature in, in the in the duality? If well, what you so this the, this computation here. Um, this is the temperature as seen by the CFT at infinity. Th that's this temperature. It's this is that's that is this. So the metric at the boundary it has this conformal factor. But the right way to think about the boundary metric is that in this convention it is simply minus dt squared plus the omega squared. There's just a, that's the boundary, that's the conformal boundary metric. Uh, and the periodicity we compute here is the periodicity of imaginary time. And that is the usual time with standard normalization on the boundary of ADS. So this is, in these conventions, it's really the temperature as seen on the boundary. In flat space, uh, you have to be a bit careful maybe with this because there's this redshift factor and so on, but in uh, here th this is a well-defined temperature. If you ask about local temperatures, so as you go in, you can also try to measure a local temperature somewhere in ADS, and that will be redshifted compared to this boundary answer by the usual redshift. So that's the same is true for a black hole in flat space. The local temperature is not the same as this redshift factor. Uh, and it gets even more annoying when you get close to the horizon of a black hole, because many of the uh, particles that are being emitted have a Compton wavelength, that is roughly the Schwarzschild radius. There's a very low energy stuff. So once you get close to the black hole, uh, you no longer locally see a thermal gas, because to locally see a thermal gas, your quanta need to fit in your experimental device, and they don't. And that's why uh, you see very weird things so people have tried to, in, in the, like for example, in the Schwarzschild black hole, people have tried to compute the renormalized stress tensor 
uh, expectation value of a scalar field in the black hole background. And far away, it's a perfectly nice thermal stress tensor with like a thermal energy density and so on, and it's perfectly nice. But then roughly, when you, when you hit two times the Schwarzschild radius, you can still compute the expectation value of the stress tensor, but it no longer takes a perfect fluid form, which tells you that you're no longer in some hydrodynamic regime. And uh, it, it's, I think, not very well understood, but uh, at some point, the energy goes down again. I think at some point the pressure goes negative. It's a really weird stress tensor. But that's, a, yeah, quantum expectation values of stress tensors can do weird things. So there, you shouldn't even talk about the local temperature anymore. Thank you. Thank you. You can also, by the way, compute the, uh, the stress tensor for a BTC black hole uh, in the bulk. Uh, using some modular invariant trick, and also it's a, it's a very weird stress tensor also. In, uh, it has, uh, of, like for a scalar field, it's a very strange stress tensor. It has, uh, uh, it is diagonal, but um, yeah, the, the sort of the places where, you, where the pressure is, I think one term is positive and the other is negative, so it's a really crazy stress tensor also, yeah. Thank you. 